Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. The material in this lecture is really what gives the progressive era its name. The middle classes grew and became a major force in U.S. government. Basically, the middle class thought that the U.S. should progress to something really good. But what they thought of as good depended on whether they were largely motivated by ideas of international power and prestige, a belief in a harmonious society focused on social justice issues, a perfect society that would usher in the new millennium in religious views, or a society that would be comfortable and safe for the middle classes. Most middle class folks had some combination of these things in mind, and most of the middle class was incredibly anxious because the changes in the world around them were massive. And while these changes were exciting in some ways, it often seemed as if everything they understood was falling apart. As the middle classes grew in size and political influence, they tried to solve problems and set the U.S. on the, in quotes, right course to greatness, whatever that meant to them personally. Although some strategies and goals overlapped at times, others could run in entirely opposite directions. For example, everyone might agree that urban poverty and children dying in factories were problems, but whether they should be fixed with government assistance to the poor, measures to improve the morals of the working classes, private philanthropy, legal controls on big business, education, or tougher laws and more prisons, or some combination of all or something else entirely, could be a source of profound disagreement. This is a lecture that will be in two parts. In part one, we will look at the growth of the federal government and civil service reform, stamping out vice, evangelicals, the family, and the argument for difference, and I will explain that, of course, and the news, yellow journalism and muckraking. In part two, we will look at the ways that the middle class really did try to think through how to make a difference in the real world, for better or worse. The debate over the role of government in solving social problems, whether at the state or federal level, became a greater issue over the period from the 1880s to 1920 because of the massive changes in pretty much every aspect of the U.S., I'm mainly going to stick to federal government here in this lecture. In the Gilded Age, 1880s to 1900-ish, the federal government dragged its feet on control, reaching in sometimes, but largely letting businesses and bank owners operate freely. This would shift completely by the end of the progressive part of the progressive era whether you ended at World War I or 1920. When we started this class, we looked at three branches of U.S. government. At the time, we paid particular attention to the legislative branch and especially the way that representation, which translates into legislative power, was awarded as new states became official parts of the United States. By the time we are finished with the progressive era, the federal government is starting to look a bit more like this incredibly crowded slide. Each branch, legislative, executive, and judicial, has multiple parts, but the executive branch has positively exploded. There are departments, boards, commissions, and services, and more. This makes sense. The U.S. went from looking like the dark green in the map on the left to looking like the entire map on the right. The federal government would need to set guidelines on land use and ownership, transportation systems, communications, businesses that crossed multiple states in either production or marketing or both, banking, currency, and ever more. Meanwhile, the population of the U.S. was expanding, as we see in the yellow area in the graph on the slide. The population continues to rise with a little blip at World War II, but the yellow region, Module C, where we are now, is where that change really takes off. The population chugs along in the green region, but starts to skyrocket in ways the middle class found quite alarming around the turn of the century. At that time, much of the growth was driven by immigration. 
all of those people meant issues that government had to solve at some level, not just of immigration, but housing, employment, education, labor, voting, consumer safety, worker safety, child safety, financial security, on and on. The federal government had to fit into all of that in some way. And that meant more departments to see to new issues and more employees within departments. The bigger the government got, the more difficult it became to keep track of who was doing what and, more to the point, how they got the job. Getting government jobs had never been exactly fair. There were always open or hidden rules on race, sex, and class. And if you think about the earliest U.S. governments with people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, everyone in the governing class basically knew each other. But now there were issues like some party boss or employer granting favors to subordinates who managed to wrangle more votes from groups at the bottom, like immigrants and workers. That exchange of political favors, including jobs in return for getting votes, is called the spoil system. And you can see this character in the middle here is holding a sign that says, down with the spoil system. Government jobs are called civil service jobs, and the bigger the government got, the more of these went to the middle classes and not just those at the top. The middle classes felt like they should have what they considered a fair shot at getting any job for their ability to do the job rather than who they were friends with. In other words, a merit system. So you'll see here this sign just to the left one of the one I showed you says civil jobs for ability. And the big sign that the carriage is carrying says the merit system for all government jobs. These folks started to call for big changes in federal hiring practices or for civil service reform. And you see that in the sign on the left. This is one of those cases where ideals and self-interest overlap, but the ideals are put on hold for anyone outside of your own group. The ideal is what you see on the left. The man is being given a job because he is qualified by his efficiency and honesty rather than for anything else. That's what the little paper he's being handed says. The reality was that most of the push for civil service reform came from white Protestant men born in the U.S. and educated in the U.S. They were not keen on immigrants from anywhere, and they also were not keen on Black people in the South. In 1883, Congress passed the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act. It established the Civil Service Commission to administer appointments to federal jobs based on merit, or at least some measure of merit. The act required office seekers to demonstrate their qualifications by taking a written exam. The one on the slide is from 1912. It's actually a study guide with a sample test, like you could get for standardized testing now. I've given you the table of contents so that you can see what applicants needed to know about and one page of sample questions. So on the table of contents, there are things like copying from plain copy, report writing, arithmetic, railway mail, and one of the sample questions reads, name the largest city in each of the following states and the body of water on which it is situated, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, Alabama. Remarkably, the system, the civil service system, actually created good paying jobs for women as well as for men. In the 1890s, almost half of the applicants who passed the exam were women. In case you are interested, this on the slide is the same information as on the previous slide, but for the current civil service exam. So if you are interested in a civil service job, you can see what sorts of things you need to know and you can practice. The second great awakening before the Civil War had popularized evangelicalism in the U.S. 
Evangelicals are Protestant Christians, but within that major group, evangelicals can be spread between different smaller groups like Baptists, Lutherans, and Presbyterians. The big idea of evangelicals in the Second Great Awakening was the idea of the Good News Gospel. By accepting Jesus, sinners could be saved. During the progressive era, evangelicalism spread from being mainly a source of individual comfort to being a source of reform design among parts of the white middle class. Progressive evangelicals felt that it was a duty to improve oneself in moral terms for the good of society and the nation. Members of this particular group were pretty much all middle class and white, although their ideas influenced other groups as well as policy, and people who were not strictly evangelical joined public advocacy groups grounded in e evangelicalism, and likewise, evangelicals supported the work of secular reformers who aimed to do things like eliminating child labor that fit with their view of society. The most famous anti-vice program was temperance, which moved into prohibition. Temperance means limiting alcohol consumption. Prohibition means complete avoidance of alcohol. While this is the most famous cause, progressive evangelical reformers also lobbied against sex work, pornography, gambling, and fighting. The temperance movement was largely led by women and sometimes crossed over with suffrage associations as well as with anti-suffrage groups. The anti-vice movement can seem confusing where it crosses over with other reforms and where it encodes negotiations of power by sex intersecting with racism and anti-immigration pressure. Let's dig under the veneer of concern with vice and look at the deeper concerns motivating this group. The major forces behind anti-vice campaigns bought into the idea of separate spheres completely. The idea dates to the Enlightenment, but really came of age with the Victorians in England and their counterparts in the U.S. Separate spheres, that would be domestic and public, rests first and foremost on the idea that men and women are fundamentally different in every way. Men are aggressive and love competition. That's why they were suited to the dog-eat-dog -dog capitalist world of the 19th century. Women are timid and only want to have children and create a safe domestic space for their family. If men's barbarism is not countered by the gentleness of women, or if women step out of their soothing role, then everything falls apart. The picture on the slide here sums up both the obvious and the slightly obscured requirements of separate spheres. The mother is sewing. The father has just come back after work, and you can tell by the suit that he's wearing. The dog at their feet symbolizes marital fidelity. Now, reading a bit more, the skin and hair color are not accidents of models chosen by the artist, but are part and parcel of this particular progressive group view. The father is involved in in business. Again, you can tell from his clothing and also from his house. He's not involved in any manual labor, be it farm or factory. The mother, likewise, is not dressed for work, even housework. She would have at least one maid and a cook. The room screams money. Not big money, not Carnegie money, but money. The little girls are sweetly sewing. They have no urge to run around and be loud because they're girls. The child the father is playing with is probably his son. Little boys were put in dresses until a decade or so into the 20th century. So we have to look elsewhere for our clues. The child is standing and actively interacting with the father, all of which would likely read boy at the time. Anti-vice proponents believed that everything that was wrong in American society was rooted in vice because vice destroyed the family. Poverty resulted from vice. Drunken husbands beat their wives, working wives ignored their children. The sex trade destroyed wholesome marriages. All of that is not entirely unreasonable 
except that in practice, what it boiled down to was that the poor were poor because they had bad habits, and the way to end poverty was to fix the poor. Anti-vice campaigns were aimed primarily at everybody except the white middle class and were a convenient way to express sympathy for the poor while also blaming them for their own situation. The stereotypical drunkard was poor. And guess who was poor? New immigrants, Black people, basically folks who did manual or factory labor for low wages. If they would just clean up their act, they would not be poor anymore. In the lower two of the images on the slide, there is also the suggestion of buying the votes of poor men with alcohol. I probably won't go into this, but it was not entirely unfounded. Many of us now, when we hear saloon, think of the Old West, but what were basically dive bars in urban areas were called saloons. The photo on the right is a Jacob Rees photo. Remember how the other half lives. It was taken in New York City in the 1890s. If you were just listening to this, I suggest looking at this picture. It is extremely interesting for many reasons. Saloons were centers of social life for working class men. It's where they discussed politics or work complaints or gripes about family. Middle class men had clubs, working class men had saloons. In neither case were women welcome in these spaces. Now, it is also true that at the turn of the century, Americans did drink and they drank a lot. Not only that, but in the time period of Module C, if you look at the graph here, much of the alcohol consumed was in the form of distilled liquor, spirits that are high in alcohol by volume. Think gin, whiskey, vodka. American men did drink a lot, and they were often violent when drunk. Incidentally, before we leave this slide, this dip that you see just to the left of middle is prohibition. Much of the anti-alcohol campaign centered on a won't someone think of the innocent children tactic. In the left image, you can see drink steals the children's food. In the right hand image, you can see the dad is drinking at the bar, this dissipated bar, and the poor children are outside and possibly the mom wanting him to come home and do his duty as a man. And then the one in the middle says, help me keep him pure. Please vote against the sale of liquor. So this was a poster coming up on national prohibition. In the middle one, you also see that telling phrase, help me to keep him pure. This metaphor of cleanliness and pollution had a long history for white Americans, but it also expressed a more literal fear of the dirt and disease that characterized turn of the century cities. That disease included sexually transmitted diseases that men of the middle class could and did pick up when they frequented sex workers of the impoverished class, and they passed those on to their wife and children. We've seen that there was a race and nationality dimension to temperance. It also included a power struggle between middle-class women and men who truly bought into separate spheres ideology. The only power that the angel of the household had was to contain the innate barbarism of males. But when males were drawn into vice by bad women and men, what was a good woman to do? The answer was to emerge from her private sphere for a good cause to get rid of vice so that she could exert the only power that meek women could have over men's strong nature. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU, was formed in 1873, but it really became a powerhouse under the leadership of the charismatic evangelical Frances Willard in 1881, and you see her there on the left. Members wore a small white bow like she has here, or as part of a badge here, a picture of the white bow, and they wore that 
to indicate that they had taken the temperance pledge. And you can read that on the slide. I hereby solemnly promise God helping me to abstain from all distilled, fermented, and malt liquors, including wine, beer, and cider, and to employ all proper means to discourage the use and traffic in the same. Women, even middle-class white women, were not a block of people with identical worldviews. This really showed up when it came to the if issue of woman suffrage or giving women the right to vote on a national basis. The argument that women, like men, were fully rational humans tended to be an argument for woman suffrage. And you can see that on the top. We're calling that the sameness argument that women and men are essentially the same. The sameness argument for woman suffrage, women, like men, are humans and citizens and should have a say in a democratic government. Those evangelical women who accepted the doctrine of separate spheres and female difference could actually go two different ways. But each of these groups could be massively subdivided as well. So those who believed in fundamental difference between men and women, the difference argument for women suffrage, women being more gentle and moral than men, would balance out the votes of men on issues affecting the family, like prohibition. Now, the difference argument against woman suffrage, women being more gentle and moral than men, should stay in the home and not pollute themselves with politics. The WCTU under Willard officially came out in support of women's suffrage from the argument of difference. This argument also appealed to white women who argued that they should get to vote on the basis of race to balance out those votes from other people. This subgroup of the subgroup also tended to favor segregation and anti-immigration laws. On the right, people are often surprised that there were actually women who were against women's right to vote, but there were. Many of these were white women who were comfortably well off and who feared that a big change like voting rights would disrupt their comfortable world and that they would be incapable of dealing with other situations. That gives us an idea of the complex set of motivations for evangelical women and campaigns against vice. But what about men? There were men who joined mainly women's groups. They were not infrequently mocked by other men for being effeminate and weak. Perhaps the most famous man to forge on with his own free of women anti-vice campaign was Anthony Comstock. He was of the sort that felt that sex as an act was foul and polluting because it involved intimate contact with a woman and women were inherently impure. Using an angel of the hearth wife for reproduction, preferably with everyone's eyes closed, could be tolerated. But anything else even suggesting sex to him, Comstock, was the worst kind of vice. Comstock was not hugely popular with any group except evangelical men. So I have a couple of cartoons from the time at the slide. One of them shows Comstock dragging a woman before a judge, and Comstock is saying, Your Honor, this woman gave birth to a naked child. And the one on the right, it's called actually That Fertile Imagination and was published in Life magazine in 1888. Comstock is shown arresting an artist for depicting a possibly naked woman almost totally submerged up to her neck. And Comstock is saying, don't you suppose I can imagine what is under the water? And one more on this next slide on the left. It reads, a dreadful predicament. Oh dear me, what shall I do? The woman in the foreground is saying. My shoestring has come untied and there's that dreadful Anthony Comstock just behind me. The suggestion being that if she leans over in any way to tie her shoelace, she will be arrested for being obscene. Comstock's group of like-minded men were mostly quite wealthy. Men like William Colgate, whose name is still on his company and products, including toothpaste. That is why when Comstock founded 
the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, it had lobbying power with the U.S. Congress, even though most Americans were not entirely thrilled. The U.S. Congress passed the Comstock Act, or really the first of what turned out to be multiple acts, in 1873. The Comstock Act made it illegal to send, quote, obscene, lewd, and lascivious material through the U.S. mail. This included not just naked lady photos and pornographic texts, but birth control. And not just birth control, but any reference to it was classed as obscene. Comstock and his followers in law enforcement and the judiciary enforced this law zealously. Lest you think this law was about protecting health or any concern at all for women or even young men who might go astray, it was obvious to everyone concerned that Comstock's group was aimed at reigning in women who made too many decisions for themselves. This was clear in many ways, but the wording of the charges leveled against people arrested for breaking the Comstock law were remarkably clear. The charges against one woman read, quote, by the syringes which she recommends and sells, she places it in the power of wives to prevent conception, in the power of wives. There's not even a pretense there that the concern is actually for young men and women who might be tempted into sin by the availability of birth control. And before we leave this slide, if you are wondering what a syringe is in this context, there's an advertisement for one on the right. It was basically a douche, and it was only sometimes successful at preventing pregnancy. The role of newspapers in daily life underwent a substantial change in the period of Module C. Papers went from being basically local broadsheets with a selection of national news thrown in to larger papers that got their news from the same or similar sources to, especially in the case of cities, the late 20th century idea of the newspaper with different dedicated sections for international and national news and local news. Most big papers also developed specialized pages, like the sports page, editorials, and the women's section. If you did not happen to live in a city, or if you moved and wanted a paper from your hometown, you could subscribe anywhere that the trains carrying mail could reach, although you would not expect up-to-the-hour news. Journalists could telegraph stories, so stories could reach publishers and appear in papers more quickly than the papers themselves could travel outside of their city of publication. Smaller newspapers could be a week or more behind on the news because they published what they got from the bigger papers. And the three papers you see on the slide, the Detroit Free Press, the Boston Daily Globe, and the New York Times, those are all issues from 1903. You have seen a bit of how news was covered by different papers in the preceding lectures. You've also seen how much people had to rely on the papers to know what was happening across the country meaning that news articles could have a strong influence on public opinion. This worked against railroad and mining unions in some cases and for them in others. When it came to the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire, I said that it was the kind of news that papers at the time loved to get their hands on because it was sensational. But many papers were not above sensationalizing most news, even if they had to adjust it or make it up entirely. This kind of melodramatic reporting and publication was called yellow journalism, and it was used to increase readership for a paper, although it didn't start out that way, not entirely at least. The example you are looking at on the slide is arguably the most famous example of yellow journalism, and we will come back to it in a later lecture. The term yellow journalism is an odd one, and the reason for it is also a bit odd. 
the term emerged from a furious competition for readership by two New York City papers, the New York World and the New York Journal, or really between their owners, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Joseph Pulitzer or Pulitzer, if you prefer, whose name is on the Pulitzer Prize, purchased the New York World, hence the globes and the images on the slide, in 1883. He used colorful, sensational reporting to draw attention to political corruption and social injustice. Within short order, his paper, The World, had also developed the largest newspaper circulation in the country. Pulitzer had immigrated from Hungary and started his news career by making the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in Missouri into a serious paper by the 1870s. When Pulitzer took the New York world, he intended to highlight injustices experienced by the working poor. He hired investigative journalists to do research-based stories, soon to be called muckraking. Perhaps the most famous of his journalists was Nellie Bly, who managed to get herself committed as an inmate to an insane asylum in order re to report on the rampant maltreatment of patients. The New York world also had a regular cartoon called Hogan's Alley about life in New York slums, and it was drawn by Richard F. Outcult. The comic was published in color on Sundays, which was a big deal. And one of the characters, a little Irish boy, was always shown in yellow. Readers started to call him the Yellow Kid, and eventually so did the comic strip. Both comic and character were incredibly popular. Keep that at the back of your mind. William Randolph Hearst was the son of a mining tycoon out west, and he was pretty much the opposite of Pulitzer. Hearst had built the San Francisco Examiner into a mass circulation paper. In 1895, Hearst moved to New York City and bought the New York Journal. He soon made it clear that he planned to outsell his competitors, especially Pulitzer's world, by doubling down on sensationalism, crusades, although he didn't actually care about the issues, and Sunday features. Hogan's Alley was in color on Sundays. In other words, it was a Sunday feature and a popular one at that. In 1896, in an effort to boost sales of his New York Journal, Hearst reached out to hire Outcult, the man who drew Hogan's Alley, away from Pulitzer. This launched a fierce, if very public, bidding war between the two publishers over the cartoonist, which was massively entertaining to readers in its own right. The battle over the yellow kid and a greater market share gave rise to the term yellow journalism. It also inspired satirical cartoons. Here you see both Pulitzer and Hearst dressed as the yellow kid fighting it out with one another. Once the term yellow journalism had been coined, it extended to the sensationalist style employed by the two publishers in their now completely profit-driven coverage of world events. Incidentally, Hearst ultimately won the battle and got the cartoonist out cult, but Pulitzer refused to give up publishing the comic, Hogan's Alley, and just hired a new cartoonist to continue drawing the cartoon for his own paper. The image on the screen here is not a Hogan's Alley comic, but it is the New York Journal, and it ties the anti-vice part of lecture to this part on newspapers, which is a good reminder that although I am breaking things up by topic, all of these things were going on all at once for people in the progressive era. This cartoon reads, what would happen if Anthony Comstock entered an art gallery in Italy? And it shows all of the naked statues coming to life and throwing things. At Comstock. Newspapers were not the only reading material of a more current or more perishable type than books that people read at the turn of the century. 
magazines were incredibly eclectic in what they carried, but often published both literature type stories and investigative journalism in serial form, meaning only part of it would come out with each issue. So you would need to buy several issues, at least if you wanted the entire story, or better yet, subscribe to the magazine. McClure's Magazine was founded in 1893 to compete with other quality American magazines like Harper's and Scribner's. The magazine, McClure's, achieved distinction and national fame at the turn of the century by launching the so-called muck-raking era in American journalism, bringing together a team of pioneering journalists that included Ida Tarbell, Ray Stannard Baker, and Lincoln Steffen. The magazine published a series of deeply researched exposés of abuse and corruption in American government and big business. Over a five-year period, the magazine's investigative reporting launched major campaigns for reform and triggered a spate of new legislation, while the paper's circulation reached over half a million readers. One of the key reporters for McLaurs, Ida Tarbell, wrote articles on John D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company. She publicly revealed how he had achieved a monopoly in refining, transporting, and marketing oil. This appeared in serial form in McClure's magazine between November 1902 and October 1904, so over a long period of time, before being published as a book, History of the Standard Oil Company, in 1904. Rockefeller was not best pleased and described Tarbell as Miss Tarbarrel. Tarbell wrote on other issues, including women's issues, but is perhaps best remembered for taking on Rockefeller. Another of McClure's high-profile writers, Ray Stannard Baker, started out in 1892 working for the newspaper, the Chicago Record. His experience there shaped his outlook for the remainder of his career as he came face to face with the misery of Chicago's poor. Soup kitchens, charity wards, and thousands of homeless, starving men in the streets. He later said, my attitude, his attitude at first, was that of the frontier where I had grown up. Bums, tramps, why don't they get out and hustle? Why did they quit Chicago? His attitude began to change after he tried unsuccessfully to help a youth find a job. Baker claimed that he was haunted for the rest of his life by this potato car boy. Baker was incredibly broad in his coverage of social issues. He did an expose on Andrew Carnegie's U.S. Steel, but also covered mining strikes, the Pullman strike, and the realities of life for Black Americans in the South, including lynching. Tarbell, Baker, and other muckrakers later left McClure's to start their own magazine. Of course, McClure's did not have a monopoly on muckrakers. We've already seen Upton Sinclair's The Jungle about meatpacking in Chicago and Jacobs Reese's How the Other Half Lives showing poverty in New York City. These and other muckrakers caught the attention of middle-class Americans who put pressure on political figures, including presidents. Some muckrakers were more successful than others, and some issues were better received by the white middle class than others. We will look at legislation that did and did not result in part two of this lecture.